Ephesians chapter number three, we've been studying for quite some time now through the book of Ephesians, and we just have now crossed the threshold into chapter three, and we're going to read together this morning verses one through verse number 13, and I want to preach on, on this thought, kind of a title for this particular section, a parenthetical purpose for prayer, a parenthetical purpose for prayer, and that's kind of what we're going to see this morning, the, the, the last handful of verses here in Ephesians 3, Paul is going to offer a, another prayer on the behalf of these Ephesian believers and even the surrounding community of believers. He's going to pray for them, but what we find in these first 13 verses is kind of a, a parenthetical statement where Paul is stating his, his purpose or really the motivation, if you will, behind the prayer that he's, that he's going to offer. So it's, it's taken us 10 months to work through two chapters. We're going to try to knock out three quarters of a chapter in, in one service. I hope you don't have plans this afternoon. Amen. And so uh, most of y'all are quiet on that. That was, that was a joke, but I will preach two and a half hours if I've got to. Amen. To get your attention. And uh, we're, just, we're just picking around with you this morning. Let's read our text, all right? Ephesians chapter 3, beginning inside of verse number 1. And Paul writes, For this cause I, Paul, the prisoner of Jesus Christ for you Gentiles. Now notice the comma inside of your English Bibles, and Paul is going to begin what we're going to call this, this parenthesis or parenthetical, if you will. Verse number two, if you have heard of the dispensation of the grace of God, which is given to me, to you, word, how that by revelation he made known unto me the mystery, as I wrote afore in a few words, whereby when ye read, ye may understand my knowledge in the mystery of Christ which in other ages was not made known unto the sons of men, as it is now revealed unto his holy apostles and prophets by the Spirit, that the Gentiles should be fellow heirs and of the same body and partakers of his promise in Christ by the gospel, whereof I was made a minister according to the gift of the grace of God given unto me by the effectual working of his power. Unto me who am less than the least of all saints, is this grace given that I should preach among the Gentiles the unsearchable riches of Christ and to make all men see what is the fellowship of the mystery which from the beginning of the world hath been hid in God who created all things by, Christ, by Jesus Christ to the intent that now unto the principalities and powers in heavenly places might be made uh, might uh, I'm sorry might be known by the church the manifold wisdom of God according to the eternal purpose which he purposed in Christ Jesus our Lord in whom we have boldness and access with confidence by the faith of him wherefore I desire that ye faint not at my tribulations for you which is your glory let's pray again together this morning father thank you for this time that we have been given and privileged to have not only to worship you through song and even through testimony, but now to open up the word of life and to look into it and to glean from the immense wisdom that is contained inside of this infallible book. God, I pray that you would speak to our hearts and change us, as it were, from glory as unto glory. God, draw us ever so closely to your side. Help us to walk today in a more intimate and sweet fellowship with you. We pray for those that may be here inside of this service that have never came to a place in their life where they have yielded their will and their heart to trust you as their Savior. I pray today that you would draw all that are in that condition to yourself. God bless our time together this morning for your glory and for our benefit. In Jesus' name we pray. Amen. This passage this morning that we have just read from is mainly constructed again as a parenthesis, if you will, that runs really beginning inside of verse number 2 and runs through verse number 13. If you have your Bibles open this morning, you can notice kind of what I'm talking about by looking at the similarity between verses 1 and verse number 14 of Ephesians 3. Paul begins in verse number 1, and he says, For this cause I, Paul, the prisoner of Jesus Christ, for you Gentiles. And then he, he goes through verses 2 through verse number 13, and then again picks back up that same statement inside of verse number 14. For this cause I bow my knees unto the Father of our Lord Jesus Christ. And so what we have in between, if you will, sandwiched in between verses 1 and verse number 14 uh, is uh, this parenthetical 
discourse, if you will, where Paul is kind of backing back up and reestablishing certain truths before he offers this certain prayer. Now, this is the second prayer that Paul has actually offered on the behalf of these Ephesian believers inside of this epistle. The first prayer uh, takes us back into chapter 1 where, where Paul prays that the eyes of their understanding would be enlightened and that they would be increased and God would just continue to, to illuminate them and give them power for the work and the calling that was at hand inside of their life. Uh, he begins uh, again here in chapter 3 by making this statement for, for this cause which is kind of an expression that, that ties us back together to some aforementioned truths, if you will. Paul is going to build the premise of his prayer on what he has already been discussing together. Now, I'm going to ask you this morning, very early on, if you will just please give me some, some, some leeway here uh, this morning. I promise I am going to build to a certain thought but, but it may get a little bumpy getting there along the way, all right? You're going to have to endure through a little bit of a lecture, and then we're going to get to the good stuff, if you'll just kind of kind of bear with me this morning. And, and so, so Paul begins uh, chapter 3 and verse number 1, and he says, For this cause, again, just kind of drawing our mind back to some aforementioned truths of chapter number 2. Now, here the apostle has established, remember, here in the last several weeks we've been going over this, the apostle established that God, inside of his infinite wisdom, has brought together both Jew and Gentile together and have placed them, if you will, on equal terms in the family of God. And all of this has been accomplished by the great theme of faith. Inside of Jesus Christ, there was absolutely no longer any distinction between Jewish believer and Gentile believer. They have been established on the same foundation, part of the same family. In fact, backing back up, verse number 20, verse number 20 of chapter 2, Paul says that we are built upon the foundation of the apostles and prophets, Jesus Christ himself being the chief cornerstone in whom all the building, uh, every single member of the body of Christ, all the building is fitly framed together and as we come together in the unity of our faith we grow together Paul says unto an holy temple in the Lord now after after stating this primary purpose back in verse number one of chapter three uh, this primary purpose of his upcoming prayer Paul again is going to revisit that same subject that he's been dealing with in the latter part of chapter number two again that that subject of the Jew and Gentile being brought together in the infinite wisdom of God. It's as if Paul feels that the Ephesians were not ready to hear his prayer in their behalf until they really grasped and better understood this, this union that had, that had taken place. They weren't going to appreciate, if you will, the content of this prayer unless it, it had really sunk into them. You, you see, inside of the church of, of Ephesus, there were, where there were Jews that had been converted to Christianity, and, and then there were, they were pagan heathenistic Gentiles that had been converted from pagan idolatrous religions over into, into Christianity where they had confessed Christ. And so two people from two distinct kinds of, of backgrounds and their place inside of the body. And so it would have been real easy, if you will, for the Jewish believer to, to look down on the Gentile believer and say, well, you know, we're glad that you're saved and all, but we're still, we still kind of outrank you because we come from a religion that was God's heritage inside of the Old Covenant, and, uh, and, and we were God's chosen people according to the flesh. And so it would have been real easy, and I, I know we don't see that inside of a Baptist you know, uh, atmosphere like this, but real easy for folks to be kind of condescending and, and look down their noses at other folks that, that had more of a past, if you will, coming in. And, and so Paul is writing to them and he's, and he's saying, I want you to get this, that you're no better than these Gentile believers. But then it would have also been real easy for these Gentile believers to, to come in and, and, and almost come in with an inferiority complex and thinking that, that hey, we're, we're kind of second-rate believers and we didn't have the oracles of God committed to us. We didn't. We didn't have the prophets. We didn't have the, the temple and the tabernacle and, and all of those kinds of things. And, and so again, Paul is writing to them at the same time in the same stroke of the pen. And he's saying there's no need for an inferiority complex because you are now placed inside of the same body, members of the household, the very family 
of God. And so Paul is saying here, if you will, in verses 2, as we're going to see verses 2 through verse number 13, he says, I really need you to get a hold of this union of the body of Christ to really appreciate and to grow together as you ought to as believers ultimately for God's glory. Paul refers to, a, uh, to, to this, uh, this great union, if you will, in verse number 3, if you have your Bible still open, as a mystery. He says, how that by revelation, God, he made known unto me the mystery, as I wrote afore in few words. Paul refers to this mystical union of Jew and Gentile as a mystery. A mystery was a secret which had been kept until now, a, a secret, something not previously known, if you will. In other words, folks inside the Old Testament predominantly and generally didn't understand that eventually one day Jew and Gentiles were going to be gathered together in a new creation. Remember, we looked at that several weeks ago, 2 Corinthians 5, 17, that if any man is in Christ, he has become a new creature. And that, that's not talking about the, your eye color or hair color or anything like that in, in outward terms, but it refers to the fact that we are now part of a new creation. We are part of not just a Jewish community or a Gentile community, but we're part of the church of God. We're part of the very family of God, a very, a very special elect group if you will. And, and, so, and so we've been gathered together and Paul says this has been a mystery by and large through the successive years of history. Now what exactly does, is Paul talking about? Well, again he's talking about that Jews did not realize that Gentiles would receive or would be received as they were and be a part of the family of God. Which is, which is very interesting to me because, because we say it wasn't understood and it wasn't. Uh, there was probably no Pharisee <laughs> Uh, the, the, the great religious leaders of Christ's day. There was probably not one Pharisee, if you would have challenged them, that would have ever told you that the Gentiles would, be, would have equal rights to the blessings of God as did the Jewish uh, community. Nobody would have understood this. Nobody probably would have believed that. And, and that's interesting to me when you consider some of the statements that are found inside of our Old Testament. In fact, for the Jewish-minded person, if they would back up all the way to Genesis chapter number 22 to a man by the name of Abraham. In fact, Jews would refer to him in our modern vernacular as Father Abraham because he was the, the actual first patriarch, the first father in the lineage of the Jewish race of individuals. And remember, God had come to Abram back in Genesis 12 and had called Abram out from Ur of the Chaldees and, and God had said, I'm going to establish my covenant with you. And, and, and in establishing that covenant, we find in, later on in Genesis 22, verse number 18, here's what God says to the patriarch of the Jewish family. God says, and in thy seed, that is, Abraham, in your seed shall all the nations of the earth be blessed. Now, that's an interesting prophetical statement that God makes in the life of Abraham because God doesn't say, Abraham, I'm just going to bless your particular family. But what God does say to Abraham is, Abraham, I'm going to use your family. I'm going to use your seed. And by the way, the New Testament said that he said seed, singular, not plural. And that wasn't by accident or coincidence. But, but what God is saying to Abraham is through your descendants, there's going to come one main descendant that is going to be the source of blessing, not just for your family, but for all nations of the earth literally it doesn't matter where you're from or who you are what color of skin or what economic class you're in this this one seed this one descendant is going to be responsible for blessing all the nations of the world later on in a prophetic voice Joel would utter these words Joel chapter 2 and verse number 32 a verse that is off quoted inside of the New Testament the Bible says and it shall come to pass that whosoever shall call on the name of the Lord shall be delivered. Now, now, if I just read that to you, just the latter part of that phrase, you would probably assume that I was quoting from the book of Romans, as does the Apostle Paul. But Paul was quoting in the book of Romans from Joel's prophecy, Joel chapter 2, verse 32. So this was an Old Testament message. God said before the birth of Christ, before, before what we consider to be the gospel message, God had already foretold that there was going to come a time in 
in the future where whoever, regardless of their, of their ethnicity, regardless of their economics, regardless of their past or their lineage or anything else, that it would come to pass that whosoever would call on the name of the Lord, that they would be delivered or they would be saved. Isn't that an amazing message? An absolutely amazing message that's found inside the Old Testament. And, and those aren't the only two. Those are, those are probably two of the more premier statements. And yet as you come over into the New Testament, these individuals are still like looking around like a deer in headlights thinking, what in the world are these Gentiles doing assuming the same rights and so you have books that are written like the book of Galatians to to contradict the error that now a now a Gentile has to become a Jew before he can become a Christian or to maintain his good Christian standing and there's all these heresies that stem out of this unproper understanding that the Gentiles are going to be received and engrafted in to the very family of God and again Paul is simply saying I want you or I need you to get a hold of this equality of truth so, so what I want to do this morning just in the time that we have left together this morning is I want us to work through this parenthetical statement just in kind of an outline form again because I really have somewhere I'm going I promise you y'all smiling act like you believe what I'm saying this morning all right I want us to work through this this parenthetical statement quickly and just draw some conclusions before actually looking at the prayer that Paul prays and we'll do that next week so so just kind of an outline four things that I want to give to you this morning number one we find in verses one through verse number three the mystery discovered in verses 1 through 3 we find the mystery discovered Paul says again for this cause I Paul the prisoner of Jesus Christ for you Gentiles if you have heard of the dispensation of the grace of God which is given to me to you word how that by revelation made known unto me the mystery he made known unto me the mystery as I wrote afore in a few words now Paul reminds them of this verse number two this dispensation of the grace of God that had been entrusted to him the word dispensation primarily signifies the management of a household uh, a, a dispensation if you will uh, the word is actually translated elsewhere in the New Testament by the word stewardship um, Paul says that uh, that God has entrusted to me something uh, uh, he's, uh, he's given me the responsibility, something that I don't own. That was the idea of being a steward. You remember that? A steward is someone that is entrusted with something that doesn't belong to him, but he's been put in management over. He's supposed to, he's supposed to oversee it and take care of it. And so Paul uses that same terminology in relationship to the grace of the gospel of Jesus Christ. And Paul says, God has given me this this stewardship, this dispensation, I am managing the grace of God. But, but here's what Paul says. Paul says, in, as far as teams are concerned, Paul says, I'm on your team as the Gentiles. I'm, I'm your management. I'm, I'm, I'm your overseer, your steward. God gives me this gospel. God has entrusted to me this gospel message, and I have brought this to you. So Paul simply states again that God had entrusted to his care the unveiling of this great mystery that the Jew and the Gentile could be reconciled into one family, the mystery discovered. Then in verses 3 through verse number 6, we have the mystery explained for us. Verse number 4, and Paul says, Whereby when ye read, ye may understand my knowledge in the mystery of Christ which in other ages was, uh, was not made known unto the sons of men, as it is now revealed unto his holy apostles and prophets by the Spirit, that the Gentiles should be fellow heirs of the same body and partakers of his promise in Christ by the gospel. In the mind of the Jews, there would always be this certain distinction between them and the other nations. Little did they know that God would take two polar opposite people groups and unite them together. Two people groups that were severely at odds with each other. Now you think there was contention between the Jews and the Samaritans. Remember that in John 4, that the Jews didn't have any dealings with the Samaritans. In fact, they would go out of their way not to not have to even go through Samaria. They, they didn't want anything to do. Well, well, that same stigma increased was their outlook onto, onto the Gentiles. In fact, you remember even in, in Jesus' Uh, uh, one of his miracles performed, Jesus actually refers to a Syrophoenician lady as a dog, right? And that shows you the outlook that, that, that just 
the common Jewish person had towards the Gentile community. They were at odds. They, they, they literally almost borderline hated it. In fact, the Pharisees of Christ, they would have hated him because they wouldn't have considered the Gentiles to have been their neighbors. And so they would have found it permissible to actually hate people inside of their good loving religion uh, in that in that amazing uh, so uh, so so what Paul is saying is God has given to me this responsibility this privilege of bringing to you this gospel message of letting you know that you are now included inside of the family of God and, and here is this this mystery kind of unveiled for you that you can be on equal terms in the family of God he put them together Paul says in one body inside of one body and that is he, he puts somebody inside of one group he makes them fellow heirs and beneficiaries of the same promise in Christ by the gospel now uh, just real quick like let me let me just uh, hit upon a little theological tone here this morning in no way shape form or fashion do we believe uh, that the church has ever replaced the nation of Israel uh, we do not affirm replacement theology at whatsoever and, and we are, are very firm in our belief and affirmation that God promised to Abraham and to his descendants a certain piece of ground and God is going to deliver that piece of ground once and for all eventually inside of the millennial kingdom to that nation of Israel and earthly elect people but as far as the spiritual blessings are really concerned there is absolutely no distinction between Jewish and Gentile believers now, now let me make that a little bit more relevant for us today that means that there's no distinction between a black believer and a white believer there's no distinction between an Asian and a Latino there's no distinction between a poor class believer and a higher class believer there's no distinction what side of the tracks you live on what kind of past and there's no distinction if if drugs used to course through your veins or or if, or if you're a, the product of illicit relationships or or you've got even like the woman at the well in John 4 multiple relationships inside of your past none of that matters because in Christ Jesus his promises are yea and amen and all of that is covered and we again have become a new creature remember that inside of Christ there's neither Jew nor Gentile there's neither bond nor free there's neither Greek nor Scythian uh, there's there's male nor female and the idea is just the equality that doesn't mean that you lose your national uh, your national uh, representation it doesn't mean that, that 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 genders are completely annihilated inside of Christ it just means that that we're on equal terms in the family of God Amen. isn't that amazing that God would do that for us isn't it amazing that that it doesn't matter what kind of family or what kind of past or just who you were born to and none of that is taken into consideration here's here's the third thing this morning in verses 7 through verse number 9 we see the mystery proclaimed the mystery proclaimed Paul writes whereof I was made a minister according to the gift of the grace of God given unto me by the effectual working of his power unto me Paul says who am less than the least of all Saints is this grace given that I should preach among the Gentiles the unsearchable riches of Christ and to make all men see what is the fellowship of the mystery which from the beginning of the world hath been hid in God who created all things by Jesus Christ inside of verse number seven Paul states that he was made a minister the word minister is the Greek word diakoneos uh, it is a, a a word that refers to a servant literally who waits tables uh, Paul isn't putting himself up on some pedestal and saying look at me and and uh, and just uh, this high and holy calling that God has given to me but Paul referred to himself as just a common laborer as a minister of Jesus Christ a minister Paul says simply because the power of God has been exerted into my life now, now to clarify in verse number eight he points out uh, his own inaptness just to just to make sure no one thinks that Paul is kind of puffing himself up, up, up a little bit here's Paul's statement in the first part of verse number eight Paul says unto me this this dispensation this responsibility is given to me it's, it's kind of like exclamation point like like God did this for me I, I like like man I can't I can't really fathom that and, and look what he says verse number eight who am less than the least of all saints 
Paul didn't have this idea that I deserve this or I've earned this and, and my years of formidable training under Gamaliel and, and all that I've been through and everything else just, you know, I, I earned this. There's a tone of that inside of Christianity, isn't there? If we're not careful, that would creep up in our own life. And, and well, like we've always deserved to sit inside of a church on a padded pew. Like we deserve to sing up on a platform or play something uh, instrumentally for the Lord. Listen, we don't deserve a bit of this. Amen. Here's a message on humility. Paul says, man, I I am least than the I am less than the least of all the saints. You take the worst example of a Christian, and Paul says, I don't even deserve to be in their category. I'm a minister. All because Paul says in verse number in verse number seven, according to the gift of the grace of God given unto me by the effectual working of his power. And Paul says, God's done it all. God has done it all. God's power demonstrated in his life had equipped him to proclaim, he says, to the Gentiles the unsearchable riches of Christ. The unsearchable. The word unsearchable means not able to be tracked out. Untraceable. Uh, in, in other words, God has done so much for us, it's almost unfathomable what he has done for us. The same word is used in Romans 11, verse number 33, where Paul says, Oh, the depth of the riches, both of the wisdom and knowledge of God. How unsearchable are his judgments and his ways past finding out. Who would have ever thought of a redemption plan like what God thought of? Who would have, who would have ever thought of a way that God it could retain his holiness and yet redeem unholy men back to himself without doing any injustice to his character, but fully putting us into a place of immense blessing. He's saying how unsearchable are his ways. How, how unfathomable and, and amazing really is God to do all of this for us. Paul says that God's work of bringing these two people groups together is incomprehensible. Uh, too, too much, if you will, for natural mind to conceive that God could take two people groups that were at odds so, so sternly against each other and to reconcile them and then to reconcile them to their God. Paul says it is incomprehensible it, it, this is just just to kind of put it into good tones for us this morning this is like like putting Hitler at the same dinner table with the Jewish nation and them getting along I mean, this is this is like taking someone who has been on annihilating and destroying the entire people group and, and sitting in that and them being friends with each other and saying hey can you pass me the tea huh uh, that's what it's like that's that's what the Bible said God has God has so taken two people groups that hated each other and he's made them friends that's the idea of reconciliation here he's made them friends he's he's put them or unified them together no one and Paul is saying it's incomprehensible it's unsearchable no one ever would have even considered that God ever would have done something like this you never would have thought it would have happened but then he goes on to say verse number nine but God had planned on doing exactly this here's the expression from the beginning of the world this wasn't an afterthought. This wasn't something God just come up with and, and said, oh, I think this might work out, so I'm going I'm to see what I can do here. This was God's plan from eternity past. Here, here's the fourth thing. Verses 10 through verse number 13, we have the mystery's intention here. Here's where I really want you to start really paying attention, like, like I didn't want you to pay attention to the first part. Amen. That just kind of calls you back in, just reels you back in a little bit. Here's the, the mystery's intention, verse number 10. Paul says, to the intent that now unto the principalities and powers in heavenly places. There's, there's an important expression we're going to come back and see in just a moment. To the intent that now unto the principalities and powers in heavenly places might be known by the church the manifold wisdom of God according to the eternal purpose which he purposed in Christ Jesus our Lord in whom we have boldness and access with confidence by the faith of him. Wherefore, I desire that you faint not, Paul says, at my tribulations for you, which is your glory. Now here, here it is simply put. The church, as comprised of every single person in its membership, serves to this primary end, and that is to glorify God. That is the church's primary function. But notice, if you will, the specific wording of verse number 10. Paul says, to this intent, now here's that expression, unto the principalities and powers in heavenly places. And that refers to the angelic community. That's a, that's a statement, sometimes or predominantly used of, uh, of, of just normal, regular 
angels, also used of, of fallen angels at, at, at points in time inside the scriptures. But, but it refers to the angelic community. And, and so here's what Paul's, Paul's saying. Paul is saying that, that unto, or, or there's this intention in this eternal purpose of God to do something, watch it, on the behalf of the powers, the principalities and powers in heavenly places. God is doing something in this eternal plan of redemption for the benefit, if you will, of the angelic community. Now, now here's, here's what I find fascinating this morning. That, that you and I, predominantly, generally speaking as, as humanity, have this, uh, this in, interest or, or fascination with, with angels, right? Do, do, we, do we not? I mean, there's, you know, just generally speaking, there's, there's television shows. You know, when I was growing up, there was, a, there was touched by an angel. And, you know, there's angels in the outfield. Y'all don't look at me like you don't have TVs. Amen. All right. For those of you that don't know what that is, you're just too young. All right. Uh, but, uh, you know, there's this fascination with, uh, you know, with the supernatural realm and what's, what's going on in, in, in realms that you and I can't see. And, you know, there's prayers, you know, about, and, you know, there's angels. And we talk about, do we have guardian angels? And, and, and so there's this fascination, and, and, and you and I probably, as long as like I'm, I'm safe, in a safe place, you and I would probably love nothing more than to kind of be able to peer over into that realm and really see an angel at work. Wouldn't that be neat, you know, like as long as he's not like pulling a sword and going to chop my head off, something like that. You and I would probably love and be fascinated. There's this, there's this interest we would have of kind of looking at the angels and seeing kind of all of what they are involved in. We would love to have that opportunity. But, but here's what Paul says in distinction to that. Paul states here in verse number 10 that instead of the angels being put on show or performance for the church to look at, what Paul said in verse number 10 is God has put the church on display for the angels. Paul says in verse number 10, for this intent, to this intent, that now the principalities and powers in heavenly places, that they could learn something. That they might, uh, he, he says, might be known by the church, the manifold wisdom of God. Listen to me, church. God is teaching the angels a lesson about his wisdom when he looks at the church, when they look at the church. He has so worked inside the body of the redeemed that the angels in heaven that stand and cry, holy, 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 the ones that always behold his face and, and love him, the ones that, that he could have dispatched to save him, the agony of, of the cross. The Bible says that, that God has them in a lecture hall and they're peering over the portals of glory and they look into our lives, our experience, and God says, I'm teaching the angels just how wise I am by the performance of the church in bringing Jew and Gentile, all nations of the earth together into one particular family. And they're seeing us. Uh, they're, they're looking at us. They're, they're, they're seeing us, if you will, shows to them, Paul says, the manifold wisdom of God. Now, now and, and unless you think this is just some some straight bullet that Paul kind of kind of caught as it was passing by. Listen to the words of Peter, 1 Peter 1 and verse number 12. Peter says, unto whom it was revealed that not unto themselves, but unto us, talking about the Old Testament prophets, they did minister to things which are now reported unto you by them that have preached the gospel unto you with the Holy Ghost sent down from heaven. He's talking about the message of salvation. He's saying the, the prophets foretold, and now that message is being brought to you. And then Peter concludes verse number 12 by saying this, which things the angels desire to look into. God's putting a show on up in heaven, and it's the church, and it's what God's doing in and through the church. And, and listen, and, and it's not at Carnegie Hall. It, it's, not, it's not in the arenas, but it's taking place right here at Fellowship Baptist Church. It's the fact that you and me are no longer at odds with each other and that we love one another. Folks from all different kinds of backgrounds. Fol folks would pass, man, if you knew some of the folks sitting inside church this morning, you'd go out and lock your doors. <laughs> I mean, I mean, it's amazing. And, and God says, God says, I am, I am doing such a work in you that all of heaven is amazed at my wisdom because of the unity and the reconciliation. In fact, he says, verse number 12, that because of God's manifested wisdom, we can be very plain in telling you that we trust him. Verse, verse number 12, look, look at how he says it. He says, in whom we have boldness and access with confidence by the faith of him. 
he, he, Paul, Paul, is, Paul is saying here, it, it's interesting, he, he draws all of this now. Uh, the idea of, of boldness and confidence, two words that, that might could be understood better in our vernacular by the words of frankness and trust. Now Paul says, verse number 12, in whom we have boldness. We, we can be very blunt here. We can be very frank with you. We, we, don't have to, we don't have to sugarcoat our message. We have boldness and then we have confidence. We, we have trust. We have a, a reliance. And Paul, Paul says, because of the wisdom of God that's been set on display in the church, and because we've seen the way, even us, we've seen the way God has worked inside of our lives, Paul says, I can be very blunt with you in telling you that I have no reservations to tell you that I trust Christ. I'm dependent upon it. I, I can see Paul just kind of just saying you know, to the Ephesian believers, look at me, I'm not a bit more nervous to tell you that I trust Christ. I'm not embarrassed by my faith. I'm not kind of hiding over here in the shadows and thinking, man, I hope they don't ask me a question because I don't know how I'm going to respond. Paul says, I'd be very bold. I'd be very frank with you. I trust Christ because of what he has already done inside of my life. He has proven himself time and time again. Then he goes on, verse number 13, and he says, Wherefore I desire that you faint not at my tribulations, for you, which is your glory. Paul says, because he's proven himself time and time again, because, because I had this boldness, this frankness, where I, where I have confidence, I have trust, a reliance upon him. And Paul says, don't worry about the things that you've heard I've been going through because I trust him. I trust him with my life. And you want to know why I trust him, Paul says, not just because of what I read on the pages of Scripture, but I trust him because he's proven himself to me. God has, God has shown me his power and his wisdom and while I hadn't always understood and I have had questions along the way I am privileged with 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 this concept of hindsight where now I can look back over the longevity of my life and I can see really that God does do all things well and that is this morning the hope of the child of God a future expectation that all that is happening is happening for some greater purpose that we will soon experience Paul says Paul says what I'm going through right now I may not understand it but don't faint don't don't don't, don't be upset don't don't worry about me and what I, we may not understand it but but farther along we'll know all about it just give just give it a few more days give it a give it a little bit more time and God's God's plan is going to become evident as we see all of this start start falling into place in faith here's how Paul said it in Romans 8 and verse number 18 Paul says, for I reckon that the sufferings of this present time are not worthy to be compared with the glory that shall be revealed in us. I don't understand it. And yes, yeah, tough. But Paul says, I want you to know what I'm going through right now ain't got nothing on what's going to happen to me in the future. And he says, and I, I can be blunt with you about that. I trust him. Do I understand what he's doing? Can I write a dissertation on it right now? Absolutely not. But I know this. He's right. He's right in whatever he's doing in my life. You see, this morning, here, here's the idea, and I, I know it's almost seemed like the last several weeks we've been kind of beating a dead horse, but I want you to get this. It, it, what he was talking about in the latter part of chapter 2 in this parenthetical, verses 2 through verse number 13 in, here in chapter number 3, it's not just about understanding the Jews and the Gentiles being reconciled to Christ. That's, that's not the big message here this is about seeing the larger picture and here's the larger picture picture the wisdom and work of our God to do what he has always planned to do against all odds no matter how impossible no matter if nobody ever would have thought it ever would have happened because God determined it was going to be done it was done Now listen to me church we live in some very weird days and we're questioning things that we probably have never questioned in our lives as Americans and we're wondering what does the future hold and man it looks like a mess and I don't think anything could ever be brought in the where, where how can we ever get out of this mess listen to me very carefully this morning God has made some sure promises in his word 
And it may look like they're far-fetched, and it may look like they're impossible, and who ever would have thought in their wildest dreams that they ever would happen. But I'm going to tell you one day, one day, church, we're going to be on the other side of this thing, and we're going to see that God has been true to His Word. And we can trust Him. And, and look, when you go to school this week, or you go back to work, or wherever it is you go, you can walk in with your health. It doesn't matter who got voted in. It doesn't matter who didn't get voted in. It, it doesn't matter who's in office. It doesn't matter what the economy is doing. None of that really matters. What matters today is that Jesus Christ is still sitting on the throne. That's all that matters. And he does all things well. Now what are some intended immediate takeaways from a, from a parenthetical purpose for Paul's prayer? Paul's just building here. He's going to pray. We're going to look at the prayer next week. Paul's just building. But what are some takeaways from just, just Paul showing his motivation for the prayer that he's, that he's going to offer? Three things and, and then we're finished this morning. Number one, we should not count anything as an impossibility with God. We should not count anything as an impossibility with God. Isn't that really the testimony of Scripture all the way through from Genesis to Revelation? That when we would have thought there was no hope because of God, there was still hope. In fact, in fact, here's, here's, here's what Jesus said on, on one particular occasion. With men, this is impossible. But with God, all things are possible. So, so let me ask you this morning. What have you thought was hopeless in your life? What, what have you thought was, was beyond reach? What, what, what relationship inside of your life? What, what obstacle? What, what circumstance? What, what is it right now that, 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 uh, that, that you just desperately want and need? But, but if you're honest and pressed to it, you're, you're kind of thinking, man, I don't know if this will ever work. I don't know if it will ever get fixed. I, I don't know if it will ever go back to being normal. What, what, what is that right now? Let, let, let me say to you this morning, don't count God out. <laughs> And don't, don't ever come to this conclusion that, that, that it's impossible and it'll never happen. If anything, uh, the story inside of our Bible that God has joined together, both Jew and Gentile, is a lesson that nothing is ever impossible with God. Don't count God out. Number two, to live in the reality that God has made us spectacles. We should constantly live in that reality. Listen. Not, not, not just with the angels. That's, that's pretty amazing. Like, I'm going to be honest with you. Before this past week, I never really thought about that much. But, but God is, he's put us on show for the angels. They're, they're watching us. They're learning about God's wisdom through what God is doing in and through us present tense. That's, that's, that's pretty amazing. So to understand this, church, that God is performing in us. You understand? He is, he is putting us on display but more than the angels are looking at us we've got a whole world that's looking to us here's how Paul said it, said it 2 Corinthians chapter 3 verse number 2 you are our epistles written in our hearts known and read of all men now Paul says uh, when folks are looking at your life it's like they're reading the Bible because your life is matching up to the testimony of Scripture and be sure of this, they're watching us. They're, if they weren't watching us, Jesus never would have said, let your light shine before men. They're watching us. They're looking at, hey, be not unwise, Paul said, but understanding what the will of the Lord is. Why is that so imperative? Because they're watching. Number three, and I'm finished, be comfortable yielding our lives to Him. We should be comfortable in light of all that God has done. In this infinite plan, this eternal wisdom of God, we should be comfortable yielding our lives to His will. Like, like Paul, we may not understand. Listen, listen to me, church. There's, there's, there's folks here that my heart literally breaks for. I don't know why certain things have happened inside of your life. I don't. I wish I did. And as a pastor, that troubles me. I wish I could sit down with you and say, and say, hey, here's point one, two, and three, and this is why, and this is what God's doing, and you can't see it, but I can. I wish I could do that, but, but sometimes my hands just go up in the air along with yours, and I think, what in the world? I, I don't get it. I don't know why. Listen, and, and, and if that wasn't kind of, kind of fatiguing enough, listen, there's going to be other things like that that happen in our lives in the future, and we're just not going to know but listen here's the here's the confidence here's the boldness that we have I can trust him with my life even though I don't understand at all and, and I can I can trust him because of what I read on the pages of scripture and listen I'm not taking anything away from the Bible and you know that 
at all. But I can also trust them because of what I've already been through in my life. And I know, I know that God has something greater in store for our life. He's doing something much bigger than what we see in our finite minds. We just can't wrap our head around it. Here's, here's what Jesus said in Matthew 16, 25. You know it well. For whosoever will save his life shall lose it. And whosoever will lose his life for my sake shall find it. If there's an encouragement from this scripture this morning, it's just that to me. It is for us to bring our lives again back to him and just say, God, I don't necessarily understand everything about it all, but here's my life. And I trust you with it. And I can promise you this, with everything that I can tell you I don't know this morning, I can promise you this, he'll never let you down. Amen. You may not understand it. It may not all make sense right now, but show me somebody that does. The benefit to serving God is that he does everything just right. Listen, he makes no mistakes. He makes no mistakes mistakes. I can be frank, Paul says with you, about the fact that I trust God with my life. No reservations. Church, let's give it all to him. We don't, listen, do we know, can we fill in all the blanks? Absolutely not. But I've got him. And in having him, I have enough. I have enough. Let's stand this morning for prayer.